right, Ramona Clifton, welcome to Green Pill. You already know this, but first question is, will you take the green pill? <laughs> well, hi, Alex. It's really good to be here. If, if the green pill is about confidence and happiness and healthy choices to cope, then yes, I am taking the green pill. That, that is definitely a big, big part of the green pill, about 95%. So, all right, you can trust the other 5% It's not adulterated. It's, it's also good things like fitness and sleep and all that stuff. Oh, absolutely. Well, um, I'm down. Well, all right, sweet. So you take the whole, whole green pill. It's healthy. It's good. So we're here to discuss what that is for, for how you work with your clients in your specific way and the crossovers that we have. And that's kind of how come we got in touch. So... For folks listening, Ramona is an LCSW and CPC. She really focuses on therapy and coaching for creatives. Now that's germane because she's in Brooklyn, New York, one of the big hubs for creatives, of course. And what's interesting, what I found really interesting in talking to her is what's called EFT tapping, emotional freedom technique that she uses with folks to really get into their bodies and uh, become present and now you know that's an overused word you know becoming present but um she's going to walk through you know what that technique is how it works how you can apply it for yourself how it's a little different than the mdr um deep breath with all that said ramona like how did you come to mental health yourself well i started um started with a psychology degree undergrad um, which I didn't quite know what to do with, and I, I veered off into music. I worked in record stores and with musicians, um, and then I got a job in a psychiatric inpatient hospital, and it was while I was there that I got very into direct care um, with adults, um, and the social worker there actually suggested to me that I go get my social work degree and um, do work with people um, because he saw that I had an aptitude. So I really appreciated that encouragement and then I was off to my master's after that. And that was and up what in What kind of folks were Boston. at that uh, inpatient? Yeah. Uh, this this was, was an Boston? inpatient, yeah, it was a state oh. psychiatric hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, so it was um, people that had um, suicidal ideation or even suicide attempts um, were brought to our hospital. Um, we would have um, police involvement sometimes, you know, if, if a person was on the street and the police got involved, um, we were the facility that the individual was brought to. and so. We would um, work with people when they were coming in, um, you know, sometimes psychotic, um, sometimes violent, um, sometimes with serious intent for self-harm. And our job was to, you know, keep them safe and um, give them the kind of treatment that would help, you know, put them um, healthy and back into uh, their, you know, living environments outside the hospital. Um, but it was a, I was there for two years and it was a real education. I can imagine. Um, and did, after you finished your master's, did you go back to the inpatient psychiatric setting uh, for like some kind of internship or where did you go after that? I'm um, just so actually, yeah, then, then, uh, then I, I, I started on a lot of different paths. Um, I actually never did go back to inpatient. Um, I, I did retain a real um, kind of respect and, and I think insight for major mental illness and the impact that it has on individuals and families um, and also um, the, the mm -hmm. you know combination of medication plus support. Um, that's been a uh, you know, value that I've held since my time in the hospital. But yeah, after I got my master's, um, I did a lot of different things. I did home visits, um, supporting families whose children had been hospitalized. So we were doing home-based visits to help the child and the, the family um, understand what was going on and, and give them treatment in their home. Um, shortly after that, I moved to New York City and I started at um, 
a, a series of mental health clinics, usually community outpatient clinics, um, mostly working with adults mm -hmm. on an outpatient basis. And then I started my and, private and practice so in Boston about 2010. To, oh. In 2010. Oh, just, uh, so, so I guess you've really run the gamut um, from you know, really severe psychiatric illnesses that, you know, you and I just discussed before the, before we press record, um, through community mental health, which sometimes could be a little less severe, you know, sometimes just as severe. Um, and with your private practice, I know that you focus on creatives. How did you, how did you get to work on creatives? Was it just like your love of such people from the record store and your time in the music world or like, how did that show up for you? That's, yeah, that's a great question. I think working with creatives is where my personal interests comes together with my professional training um, because, uh, you know, all my life I've loved music. It really speaks to me. I've, I've really had a, a, a deep response to it. And I do play music myself at, on a very amateur level. Um, I've also... <laughs> had a lot of friends and I've been fortunate to see, um, to, to work with people that I've, I've kind of watched them rise throughout their careers. Um, and I've been involved in music one way or another, whether it might be like, you know, selling merch for a band or, um, you know, helping out at a venue or, or, um, putting together a bill for, for a local show. Um, I've, always like to be involved in music it's still my go-to of you know how I relax and have fun um, and so being in that environment I always um, started talking to artists and I you know discovered a knack of people um, feeling comfortable with me and you know I ended up hearing a lot of stories and, and hearing common experiences and um, you know, really having a lot of interest and care about how essential the art, you know, the creation aspect is for any type of artist and creative and, um, you know, getting curious about what particular supports might be helpful for an artist and for a creative. So it's kind of started with my own love in, of art and music, but it's, it's brought into um, thinking about um, creatives in general, how so many professions require a lot of creativity. So that's um, that's just who I love to talk to and who I really have always connected with. Um, so that's why I've been, you know, in the past few years, more putting that forward as my focus. With creatives, um, you know, folks who, I guess if we define creatives as folks who work professionally or semi-professionally or obtain some income from uh, doing creative work, which could be design, could be music, could be writing, art, um, you know, even some other kind of probably worlds that don't seem as creative but are, um, what does that outlet do for people's mental health and, and what are they like when they don't have it? What do they like when they don't have it? That's an interesting question. I have to think about that for a second. Um, I think that, <laughs> I mean. Yeah, it was a stumper for sure. Yeah, a lot of, <laughs> what do they like when, they're, when they don't have it? Well, I think if someone has a real creative and artistic drive and they're not encouraged and they're not supported in that they're not allowed to use that in their life I think there's a tendency to become more um, you know introverted maybe um, frustrated um, I think it's really important for someone who has that mindset and and drive towards their art um, really suffers when they're not being a not able to connect with it. Um, I think that I'm, I'm trying to go back to the first part of your question. Um, in terms of what yeah, they, like they don't have it, and 
Well, I guess that was my, more, for me, that was the most important question. Like, yeah. What are they like when they don't have it? I mean, because when, when do they come to you? Is it when their creativity, well, yeah, when do they come to you typically um, oh, in their sure. journey? You know, if there, if there is a typical spot. Well, sometimes, sometimes people will reach out when they're having a particular um, struggle with, with their work. Um, say they're okay. having a creative block. It's a, it's a, it's a writer who's um, on a deadline and is really struggling with, um, you know, how do I put this together? How do I organize this book? How do I um, put out enough content for my, my work? Um, and they might be having a specific creative block and, and want help with that. Um, mm -hmm. However, a lot of clients that I'm working with are coming to me because they are creatives, they know I understand their world, but they are having other life issues, relationship problems, relationship issues that might be particularly mm -hmm. linked to their job. Um, or they may be coming for a, a, a total other reason, a health issue, uh, a, a recent loss, um, you know, uh, to, to, to deal with grief, grief or a separation or um, a, a loss of some other kind in their life. So people, you know, life happens and people show up because they need someone to talk to. They realize that, um, you know, they may feel like they're leaning on their friends and family too much. They're talking about this issue too much or they feel like they're not really getting the support that they need. Um, and they understand that maybe talking to somebody who's outside of the situation, who can offer a different perspective, who can help teach some skills and tools and have different ways of coping with the issue would, would be of use. So people come for all different reasons, actually. And so some of those reasons might relate to kind of being a, a really creative person or someone involved in the creative arts, like you said. You know, if you're on tour all year, there's certain relationship dynamics that are different than if you're a That's writer exactly and you have a right. deadline, and, and both are inherently stressful. Yeah, good, good. Well, That's I'm glad right. I understood it. That's kind of where I was driving it. That um, go ahead. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, both of those examples are, are great. They they both, um, you know, relationship issues, as you can imagine, as as you just mentioned, are are often a major challenge because. The, the schedule of touring requires, you know, sometimes long separation and then the period of, of coming back and integrating lives together, which, you know, people think that that would be really easy, but that's often the hardest um, time that kind mm -hmm. of like getting getting back into rhythm together is, is a real issue. So it's all about, you know, dealing with trust and boundaries and good communication. Um, whereas someone who's got, like you said, a big deadline, maybe they have a book and they, they feel a need to, like they may be present in the house, but they, they have to really isolate themselves and, mm -hmm. and have concentration and, um, um, you know, just time apart. So they, they may be physically present, but really not mentally or emotionally present. And that can be a real challenge for, um, you know, their, their sense of obligation to their partner and family, and it can be frustrating to, you know, people around them that want their attention. So, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of reasons that, um, you know, devoting yourself to creative work might mean especially significant periods of time where you're not as available to, to other people that you really do want to spend time with, but you can't. And yeah, you know, as you're talking about someone who needs to lock themselves in the room for a deadline, or someone who comes back from tour and you know tries to pretend everything's okay or normal, and, and maybe they want it to be, another partner wants it to be, but there's a lot of adjusting, there's a lot of boundaries, like you said, there's a lifestyle switch. Um, you know, both of those are human problems, just maybe at a different scale or magnitude because of the intensity of the time away or the intensity of the focus and I, I like how you assessed the writer 
based on their capacity for socialization, their capacity to show up in the relationship, not just physically taking the trash out, but mentally, emotionally, um, cooking, you know, even just supporting the other partner. And I think, I guess me having talked to a lot of therapists, both in my life and, you know, through this effort, I say, oh, well, that's simple. They just need to tell their, you know, they just need to give their partner a heads up and have a conversation about, well, how they're going to communicate during these states instead of just being cranky and smelling bad and not showering. They need to kind of talk about it. Um, are there any tips, tools that you give to folks other than those I referenced, if we kind of follow the writer example? And then I'd love to touch on tapping and EFT. <laughs> um, well, communication is key as as you said, um, I think it's about setting expectations. Um, if someone is, um, uh, you know, there's, there's other similar examples like an actor preparing for a role. They are going to um, be very devoted to learning, learning, you know, their lines, um, you know, getting, getting into the character and depending on their level of commitment and the way they work, some actors just kind of have to disappear into that role um, you know that's almost a metaphor for a lot of creatives working um, and I, th I think having the discussion ahead of time about what what they need and what what the time apart will look like or um, you know if, if they're present in the house what you know sort of where are the quiet hours that they are not expected to show up and do the chores and then um, you know, having their partner also express what they're going to need and, um, you know, sort of set expectations on their end about what will happen. Um, same thing if someone's going out on tour and there's, there's time apart. Um, you know, if that, um, if, if that family, if they have kids, then how are, how are managing um, children, you know, falls on the one partner at home to do that 100%. Um, while the other partner is away. So what supports can be put in place for them? So it's, it's um, a lot of it can be helped with anticipating and communicating and setting expectations and, and asking for what you need um, a ahead of time. Also communicating during the time. When is a good time to reach out to you? When is a good time? Like when can we actually have a conversation? Um, it's it's always really helpful to to at least know that there is a time where the communication will happen rather than just like i'm not i'm not available don't even bother me right now if that person can say um mm -hmm. okay after 8 p.m tonight would be a good time to talk you know some sometimes it's just real simple um but checking in with each other knowing each other's needs is essential I think it's cool how you made it really simple because as you know the genesis of this podcast is like making health simple and um, sometimes I think people look at psychotherapy or going to a therapist a counselor as just like oh finally I'm gonna go to therapy after seven years of thinking about it or someone's been nagging me to go or my life is now unmanageable or my girlfriend wants to break up with me and she won't she'll stay with me if we go to therapy and that's a really edge case and I, I mean personally I found therapy to be really helpful even when I'm okay um, and I think a lot of what you're saying, while grounded in advanced clinical theory and, and from your education, these are also just kind of typical communication techniques that folks want to be using. Uh, and sometimes you just don't learn them because they weren't modeled or they weren't taught or you didn't pick up on them for one reason or another. So I kind of like how you're orienting towards um, simplicity. I think um, that's where you have to start. Uh, maybe, yeah, yeah, that's where you start, right? And and there's probably a lot more under the surface, right? You can't just. Well, it has to be tailored you know, to each situation. You I, know, you have to have an understanding of, of, you know, what people's resources are, what what their experiences were, what what was their family communication style, um, you know, how how do they handle their own stress. Um, you know what? What do they do to support themselves um, in it, when they're feeling under pressure? Um, you know how how is how is how are arguments handled? 
you know, and it and it really has to be understood coming from each person's individual experience. I think that's it's so important to um, tailor treatment to um, what each individual is coming with. You know, I think as a kind of budding health communicator, I keep trying to distill these things into generalities. And then, of course, you can't in a way. You can and you can't, right? And it's ultimately you can do the best to generalize. But if somebody like me, if my, you know, with my mom, as you know, is schizophrenic and I will have my own challenges with, with, uh, you know, with her, she was kind of very hot and cold. Sometimes she would be kind of okay, and sometimes she'd be very loving, and sometimes she'd be extremely angry and, you know, imagining things. And so now me dealing with people, uh, I kind of expect all three, even if there's no third category, you know? And it's, so it's hard for me to get comfortable, but, you know, to, it's hard to generalize somebody giving me those tips. The only way I really found that out was through, in my case, therapy. Um, so I hear you on... <laughs> just still needing to really customize it to the person. And that's actually why I don't, I don't think there will be an AI therapist that will be particularly helpful anytime <laughs> soon. Um, Ramona, I want to um, make sure we touch on something you're a specialist in, which is the emotional freedom technique or EFT tapping. Um, could you tell us briefly what it is, what it's used for, and how it helps people? Yeah, I, I'm, thanks for asking. Um, yeah, EFT tapping is something that I started using about six years ago um, and started off slowly because it's kind of an unusual looking method. It's where you're actually physically tapping on acupressure points of your body. So, you know, I had to kind of get over my hesitation of like, I know this looks weird, but let's just try it, you know. Um, yeah, so there's there's tapping on hand points and then various points on the body. Um, and this has become, yeah, there's, there, and then there's the collarbone on the side. And um, it's, it's a method that is, is very helpful in regulating it's the nervous system. So when a person taps on themselves and uses, uses phrases that are um, kind of naming what's present, um, addressing, you know, the feeling, uh, including the feeling in their body, the somatic experience. Um, you can you rate from zero to 10 your level of activation. So for example, um, I'm having social anxiety before I'm going to a party. And you might just do a very simple tapping um, to acknowledge, you know, I'm feeling this anxiety. Um, this reminds me of uh, you know, a party where I, you know, misbehave, like I said something that embarrassed me and that, that recurrent embarrassing thought is coming in. And so we, we break it down. We use phrases that refer to that specific issue. Um, and we go through a whole tapping sequence, which um, the combination, and this is evidence-based, there's more and more research that is actually saying that, you know, tapping works. Um, so we go through a combination of saying things about the anxiety, acknowledging it, um, referring to times that we have felt it. Um, and it's kind of amazing. The reason I'm getting more and more into tapping is I've seen so many examples of when I shared it with someone um, that they would start maybe at a level eight or nine of activation, of feeling extremely anxious and upset. Mm -hmm. And then in 10 minutes, they would be down to a level, you know, two, one, even a zero, um, through going through the tapping process. And what's so wonderful about it is they experience that decrease. They they feel how their body's nervous system can reset, um, and then a whole lot of um, things become more available. You you know, when your body is in a calmer state, then you can see other other options. Sometimes when you're extremely anxious about a particular thing, it, it feels very tunnel vision and, it, and, it's, and it's very scary. Your mind is going to the worst outcomes. 
when you go through a tapping mm -hmm. session and you are calmer, all of a sudden you're more able to see other possibilities. Or you might be more able to see, well, I did that thing, but I, you know what? It's actually not so bad. I don't need to be worried about what that person thinks of me because I'm really not ashamed. Mm -hmm. That's a very normal response that I had. So it, it can help just normalize, mm -hmm. reset, and, and you know, have, have like a clearer approach to what you're doing. Um, people can learn this themselves. There's a lot of videos online, if, you know, on YouTube. There's a ton of tapping videos. Okay. Some of them are specific, tapping for anxiety, tapping for in insomnia. Um, those are things that anyone can use at home to, mm -hmm. um, you know, help regulate themselves. The tapping that I do is um, more targeted. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll talk about specific incidents, earlier incidents. It, it can even tra um, t target traumas that people have experienced that might have caused intrusive okay. thoughts or other PTSD symptoms. Um, and so you want to work with a professional when you're dealing with that level of, um, um, of activation when you're really talking about traumas. But by breaking it down into very small pieces and, and working with each traumatic memory, but not re-experiencing it to a point where they're um, re being re-traumatized, but very, very carefully, there's like a very specific um, protocol that you use to help people um, take it in small bites, frame it in a different way, and and kind of clear each moment as you go along. And it's actually effective and quite fascinating and, and really inspiring how how much it can be helpful. It's it's um, it's a way of um, reprocessing a trauma and and it's um, kind of reconsolidating it in your memory in a different way so you can have the memory but you don't have the physical and emotional activation that that memory causes. I hope so that gives on, some sense. I mean, there's so much to talk about, but I hope that gives some sense of, of some different ways that it's used. But yeah, EFT tapping, it's pretty oh, it, cool. It does, and it, it can be used, it sounds like, for something local, um, such as like preparation for a presentation, which you had cited on an original call, or you know, going to a party, or it can be a little more deep seated where somebody uh, has trauma that they know about and you can re, re, you know, consider the trauma, almost instantiate it, almost feel it, and tap at the same time with certain protocols with a clinician, which are evidence-based. And we don't, you know, we don't have time today to go into the evidence and uh, the science behind it. Um, but you've been doing it for six years. You're involved with the organization that uh, that you know, centralizes knowledge and shares about this, and uh, so. I think folks should start with YouTube videos if they're just at home, if they're not in New York. But um, are are you seeing folks in New York and virtually for tapping as well um, and psychotherapy? Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. Great question. Um, I use cool. tapping in person. I use it virtually, just like we are. Um, and I've even done it over the phone in in a in a pinch because I can verbally guide people through it. Um, but I think face-to-face -face is, is really, really the best, yeah. information online if people are interested. I mean, you can certainly find tapping videos on YouTube, and there's, there's different um, practitioners sharing techniques. Um, but you can also go to the um, ACEP, uh, Association for Comprehensive Energy Psychology, website. Um, that shares some of the research, and there's also some example videos and just a lot more information about it. Um, I'm on the ASEP Communications Committee, so I love to give them a, a plug. Uh, but yeah, As once you, you should, start looking, yeah, uh, yeah, once, once you start looking, there's, there's, there's um, a lot of information online and, and there's stuff that people could use right away if they're interested. Um, and of course, um, RamonaClifton.com, I'm happy to um, give a consultation and tell anyone more if they're interested in hearing about it. You got the question that I was about to ask, which is where can people find you? So Ramona Clifton, R-A-M-O-N-A, Clifton.com. Ramona, thank you for coming on Green Pills.